Women Up Radio, designed to facilitate women's empowerment, improve your career, develop your talents, incorporate your passions, achieve fulfillment and success. Hello, this is Women Up Radio, supporting Empower Women, and today we're talking about non-profits, insights, performance and lasting social impact for a more enlightened world, very important. I'm joined in the studio by my guest, Vivian Hexter, a principal of H2 Growth Strategies, who advises nonprofits, foundations, and corporations on planning, development, and governance for improved performance and lasting social impact for a more enlightened world. Previously, holding CEO and VP positions, and having worked on initiatives such as The Hunger Project, Vivian has recently co authored the book. Big Impact, Insights and Stories from America's Nonprofit Leaders. Well, it's a fascinating sector, and I really can't wait to hear more about creating creating lasting social impact. So, welcome to the show, Vivian. Thank you so much, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. So, tell me, you've done so much already in your career. How did you start, and what led you to choose this career path? So people ask me that a lot, and I, I think the the best way to say it, Anna, is that I have always had sort of a passion for helping the underdog. Yeah. When I was a child, I rescued a cat whose mother had three legs, and clearly the uh, kitten was not going to do very well in that household, and so I brought it home to my mother and said, we have to adopt this cat, yeah. and we did. We we had had no pets before that, uh, and so I. But I I chose initially a, a rather traditional path in the sense that I graduated from college. I I went to work in the business world, and then I got an MBA in marketing and was a what we call in the states. I was a brand manager. I I managed uh, food products for a major international food company, which is now part of Unilever, oh. and what i what i discovered was that although i was pretty good at the marketing you know i was pretty good um i could not have cared less whether we sold another million cases of skippy peanut butter or mazola <laughs> corn oil which were some of the products i worked on yeah uh i could not have cared less yeah. and i found eventually it was hard to get up in the morning to yeah. market these products and i sought uh career counseling, career coaching for the first time, and discovered that really what was missing was mission, right? So I'm very mission-oriented. I have to care a lot about the product or service that I'm marketing or selling. And at that time, and we're talking now the the, um, uh, early 90s, Mm -hmm. the the, the causes that I cared about were mostly being worked on in the nonprofit sector. So I made my way into the sector at a relatively early stage in my career, and I have not looked back. Yeah. I uh, I find that my business training is very helpful, yeah. uh, and my business experience very helpful, and I really feel good about the causes that I've helped to forward in my life, in my That's, career. I think it's wonderful, amazing. It's so nice, someone who's actually prepared to change and do something that they really care about that they're passionate about because a lot of people get sort of trapped in the cycle of not moving and not enjoying it so tell me non-profits it's not always clear what a non-profit really is in different parts of the world um, mm-hmm. particularly when some seem to be very much like a business so can you give me a brief explanation on what they do and how they help, just to clear up the confusion. Sure. And and I I will say, you know, it's good that you said that it's different in different countries Mm. because what, so the the nonprofit as we know it today, I think was really born in the U.S. Yeah. um, Out of the sort of volunteer uh, mentality that what, that really grew up from the Puritans, starting with the Puritans, Right. And so in the U.S., we have this highly developed philanthropic or nonprofit sector, and uh, it includes both public charities like 
share our strength or like Goodwill Industries or the United Way or uh, care, um, Save the Children. Yeah. Uh, so it includes public charities like that. It also includes uh, foundations, private foundations, so uh, organizations that either have endowments and mm -hmm. are giving money away or are raising money to give it away. Yeah. Uh, and, and in the U.S., at least at the moment, there is a tax advantage to being a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And so nonprofits do not pay taxes in the U.S. And people who contribute to nonprofits uh, get a tax deduction uh, when they file their income taxes. Now, that being said, it's different in different parts of the world. So I, I was telling you before we got on the air, I was just in Greece uh, yeah. teaching a workshop. And in Greece, um, there's actually a tax disincentive to giving to nonprofits. Really? So, so yes. So individuals are not particular, they, they, individuals generally don't give money away except perhaps to their churches. Yeah. Uh, and in Greece, it's the foundation uh, sector that is the most highly developed of that, of the nonprofit world. Uh, and it's not that there aren't nonprofits in Greece, there are, uh, but they are mostly supported either by foundations or, or from outside of Greece. I've got confused over it in the past because the UK, you know, the attitude is one thing, France, the attitude is another. So everyone seems to have a different interpretation and it's all very fuzzy around the edges. So mm -hmm. it's nice to know really what they are. <laughs> so, so what are the main challenges facing non-profits? Because it can't be easy. No. Well, if you, if you ask a non-profit executive what's keeping them up at night, uh, <laughs> often they will say that fundraising money is yep. keeping them up at night. In other words, the, the need to generate more revenue. And it, in the U.S. anyway, it used to be that the government supported, uh, like the federal government particularly, yep. supported nonprofits much more than it does now. So 30, 40 years ago, there was much more support from the government. Yep. And now the nonprofits that used to get that kind of support are having to really branch out and find other means of support, whether that's individuals, uh, corporations, or foundations. And so there's also, there's sort of a big movement uh, in the U.S. and I guess around the world toward what is sometimes called social impact or impact investing, yeah. where, which is kind of a hybrid between a corporate and nonprofit where the nonprofit is promising to deliver particular results and there are real investors who are getting some sort of financial return yeah. for putting money into those social ventures. Yeah. yeah. So so there's a lot of there, there are a lot of basically nonprofits are trying to figure out other ways to generate money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so would you say the rules of good business and performance are equally sound and necessary for successful nonprofit development, or is it a different focus? So I would say that, you know, it's like you're all familiar with the 80-20 rule, right? So I would say 80% of the practices that make for good corporate governance also make for good nonprofit governance. Yeah. And then there are 20% that are different. Mm -hmm. So I always like to give this example. So if I'm a corporate business leader, I am generally, I mean, I, I'm really focused on the bottom line, right? I'm focused on, um, on making profits for my shareholders. Yep. Um, if I'm a nonprofit CEO, I'm, I'm focused much of the time on making surpluses right? Not profits, but surpluses. So income, less expenses being above zero. Yeah. Um, but, I, but occasionally, and often quite a lot of the time, I can make decisions that are not profitable. Yes. So I can make, so I, I always like to give this example. When I was working for AFS Intercultural Programs, which is a leading high school exchange program in 55 countries, mm -hmm. 
I, um, we, we were one, one year, uh, there were some students from, I think it was either Indonesia or Pakistan, two students that were supposed to come to the U.S. Uh, for, to spend the year and go to school and live with a family. Yeah. And there was some kind of a stock market crash or something in that country. And the students could no longer afford to pay the tuition because, of course, there was tuition that had to be paid. Yeah. And I remember sitting with the CEO of our organization, Alex, and him saying to us, you know what? I'm now a nonprofit CEO, and I think that those students should come to the U.S., so we're going to sponsor them. All right. Uh, so, so that's the sort of thing, that's the kind of decision that a nonprofit can make yeah. that generally would, generally would not be made in a corporation. Yes, yep, I see what you mean. And so what sort of social impact can a nonprofit have on our society? Wow, that so so <laughs> the, the, the list question. is sorry. Yeah, the <laughs> list is so no no it's fine, but the list is so long, right? Uh, you know whether whether it's um, uh, improving the math skills of young people in uh, Silicon Valley, because um, whether it's believable or not, there are a number of uh, sort of underprivileged communities in Silicon Valley where the students are not up to uh, grade level in their math, and this prevents them from going to the University of California yeah. because the University of California has specific requirements for, for admission. And um, the organi this or particular organization, which is called the Silicon Valley Education Foundation, uh, is um, has a very specific intervention, a summer program for kids who are entering the ninth or 10th grade, where in, I think it's 19 days, they can be sort of got up to grade level so that when they enter ninth grade, they can do ninth grade math. And when they enter 10th grade, they can do 10th grade math. And that seems to be the kind of the critical period for making sure that they stay on track with their math skills. Yeah. Um, so that's a very specific social impact because what it means is that those students who would almost certainly not have gone to college yeah. can now go to college. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and they're they're not paying a cent for yeah. that for that 19 day program. Yeah. Uh, so that's so that's a kind of a one very specific yeah. example. That, another another is so in in the U.S. we have an organization, a wonderful one called Share Our Strength. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a hunger fighting organization, and they have a campaign called No Kid Hungry. Yes. And over 10, 15, 20 years, they have managed to cut in half the number of uh, kids in the U.S. who go hungry on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. And they believe that in the next I think it's like seven or eight years, yeah. they will have ended childhood hunger in the United States. Really? Now, yes. So this is, this is a little known fact, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one, one of the reasons that we wrote the book you referred to, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's this organization doing incredible work mm -hmm. <laughs> and not enough people know about it. Yeah. Um, and, and from a global perspective, right, the CEO of this organization, Billy Shore, who's sort of a legend in the nonprofit sector, is already thinking out beyond the end of childhood hunger in the U.S. to yeah. what could be done globally. What is it that's been learned in the U.S. about ending childhood hunger, which is, you know, the whole, whole array of strategies, yes. right, between, you know, um, free school breakfasts and lunches yeah. to uh, food stamps to coaching parents on how to cook healthily. I mean, there's a whole array of strategies. Yeah. Um, but how, how could the learnings here be applied to uh, hunger globally, which, of yes. course, is an even bigger problem than it is in the U.S.? So, so these are some of the kinds of real, tangible, measurable social impacts that a nonprofit can have. You are listening to Anna Letitia Cook at Women Up Radio. I was going to ask you about examples 
at regional, national and international levels. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they very different? I mean, the way they're run and the aims they have? Would, can you make any comparisons? So just to be sure I understand the question. So organizations that are working regionally, nationally and internationally? Yes, yes. Uh, so so well, I would say the, the answer is if they're a U.S.-based organization, mm -hmm. they all have to abide by the same rules, laws, that govern nonprofits in the US. Yeah. If they're working globally, then there are a bunch of additional challenges having to do with uh, the transfer of funds from one country to another, right? Yeah. If the funds are being raised in the US and spent elsewhere, for yeah. example, yeah. Uh, uh, like the American Express Foundation. Um, so we interviewed Tim McClyman, who's the, the president of the American Express Foundation. And when they want to fund globally, which they often do, they have they pass the money through something called, get this, the King Baudouin Foundation. King Baudouin having been a Belgian or yeah. Luxembourgian king. Yeah. Uh, and they what the King Baudouin Foundation does is it's it's set up to um, uh, to to transfer the money to the different countries where it's needed mm -hmm. in a way that's legal yes. and you know totally so, transparent yeah yeah mm -hmm. um, so I don't I, so in that sense and of course if if you're say Save the Children right yeah. which is a huge global organization yeah. and you have different country you have countries you have country directors in countries that are sort of managing their own uh local country organizations mm -hmm. um but they have to just like in a global corporation right they have to report back to headquarters and there are lots of different ways of organizing that mm -hmm. yes. um but in terms of but beyond that I, I would say that, again, if they're U.S.-based, they're all having to follow the same laws. Yeah. Yes. So it's it's similar focus, and then they're in the, each different sector or different field. So, but from the, the organizational point of view, they're following a, the, the same path. So, okay, you've recently co-authored the book that I was talking about with your colleague, Linda Hartley. Big Impact, Insights and Stories from America's Nonprofit Leaders. What inspired you to write it? So Linda and I, although we've both been consultants for a number of years, uh, we, we decided to form the firm uh, H2 Growth Strategies, H2 Hartley Hexter H2, yeah. uh, um, only about two and a half years ago. Yeah. And so we're a new company. Yes. Uh, and we're a 50 plus company for sure yeah. uh, and uh, uh, so we decided that we wanted to um, to do something to both to announce the fact that we're now a company and also to amplify the voices of some of these leaders I've been describing who are really making tremendous strides in 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 solutions to social ills yeah. Uh, and are really because they're nonprofits, right? So you asked me differences between nonprofits and corporations. Mm -hmm. So nonprofits don't have big marketing and advertising budgets. Yes. Uh, and they're very much reliant on public relations or on corporate sponsorships to get the word out. Yes. And so we really felt that there's good news in social change. That's really what the book is about. Yeah. It's about the good news in social change. Okay. And so we wanted to, to get that good news out because there's so much bad news at the yes. moment yeah, exactly. around the world. Um, and we felt that we really wanted to, uh, to let the world know that there's good news coming out of the United States. Yeah. Uh, and and not, not just out of the United States, but there's good news globally about the advances that are being made and often without a lot of fanfare. Yeah. Okay, so tell me some more about the leaders and the organizations you feature. Let's get the good news out. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I thought I would uh, focus on some of the, uh, some of the women that we yes. interviewed because this is women up choice. after all. Yes. Uh, so, um, 
so we have, uh, so in, in the U.S., we have the public broadcasting system, PBS, which is kind of like the U.K. BBC. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Paula Kerger is the president and CEO of PBS, mm-hmm. which is based in Washington. And PBS is unusual in that it has, in addition to its broadcasting, it has programs, educational programs that accompany some of its uh, programs. So, and where, and there are community forums and events around the country that are in partnership with particular uh, series. So, for example, there uh, was recently a big series about uh, racial issues, Mm -hmm. and uh, there was a series of community events and educational events that accompanied that series, and it got lots of positive feedback from uh, viewers. Uh, and so there's a the, the education component of PBS is extremely important, and particularly the education of kids. Yeah. So PBS now has a 24/7 uh, online channel for kids, 24/7, because yep, yeah, because a lot of kids are you know their parents work strange hours, they work several jobs. Yeah. Uh, and so the kids are unfortunately up and down at all hours of the day and night. Yes. Uh, and we know that people use uh, television as a babysitter because they have to sometimes. Yes. Uh, and so now at any hour of the day or night, moms in the U.S. or dads in the U.S. know that they will find educational programming, quality educational programming online for their kids. And of course, PBS is all about literacy and Mm -hmm. particularly literacy, right? Early literacy. Uh, And so uh, it's a, um, uh, it's a really wonderful, PBS is just a wonderful institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so that's one example. And shall I give you another? Yes, please. Uh, So the, um, we have a, an organization called do something.org, yes. which is headed by a young woman called Aria Finger. She's still under 40. Yes. Uh, and do something.org is a campaign, an ongoing campaign to turn young people between the ages of 18 and 25 into activists and uh, engage citizens. Yeah, and they have five million uh, kids around, young people around the world, who are engaged in their campaigns at any one time, and the campaigns are generated online. Yeah, uh, and they do things like uh, in the U.S. they collected um, blue jeans to give to homeless teenagers, and they collected I don't know thirty or forty million pairs of mm-hmm. uh, blue jeans um, to give away. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a, um, it's a really fascinating concept, right? Because it, not just concept, but actual organization, because it, um, is really training young people, um, through their own medium, which is online, right? All of the campaigns get generated online, but then they get implemented in the, in the real world, not in cyberspace. Uh, and so, it's a really great way for young people to both make a difference and also learn for the long term about how to organize themselves. Uh, And I think we see some of the impact of this in the wake of the terrible shooting in Florida that happened Mm -hmm. last month, where it's the teenagers, the young people in the U.S., who are 16, 17, 18, 19, who are standing up and saying, you know, the grown-ups aren't going to take care of the gun control issue. We yes. have to organize. Yes. yes. Um, so I, you can't say that that's a direct uh, result of do something, but it's yes. that kind of, of activity 
that is a, is really teaching young people to organize themselves yeah. online. Yeah. Yes, I think wonderful. I mean, really great examples. And you'll you'll have to send me a a link to this so that people can find out more and we can really get the, the word out to more of the organizations that you featured because mm -hmm. I think things like that are just so important. And mm -hmm. if you start with younger people, if they are brought up so that they automatically want to help to improve to reform it carries through for generations so amazing yes. okay so with that um what were some of the most important leadership lessons that we can learn from these insights and stories because there must have been some really good examples about how to be a good leader and how to inspire yes so we actually you know we did almost 50 interviews yeah and um, so it was really kind of extensive research. And what we discovered was that there are, you know, and this is just our construct, right? We discovered seven principles for mm -hmm. making social change. Uh, and there are things, some, some sort, sort of more obvious things like sharpen your leadership skills mm -hmm. to uh, less obvious like... Uh, be crystal clear about your goal and articulate it persuasively. Yeah. That's a really important one. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of sharpening your leadership skills, which is really, I think, what you asked me, uh, what we found was that the emotional intelligence and self-awareness of these leaders was really stunning. Really? Really stunning. Yeah. So they might not have started out that way, yeah. right? But they definitely have evolved in that way. And it's clear that in the 21st century, being a really good leader, at least in the social sector, requires a great deal of emotional intelligence. Yes. So, for example, um, and this is a guy, not a gal. So this is Bob Giannino at U Aspire, which is a college affordability program. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's helping young people discover how to make college affordable, yes. information, education, how to get, you know, low, the best loans, the best grants, all of that stuff. Um, and um, so Bob uh, has been with the organization for a while and it's grown rapidly. Uh, and he discovered recently, so in the U.S., there, one of the hot issues at the moment is around diversity, equity, and inclusion, we call it, yes. DEI. And uh, we asked a question about racial equity in, mm -hmm. of these leaders. And what Bob, so Bob, come, Bob is white, but he comes from a uh, very poor working class uh, background. He's completely self-made, the first person in his family to go to immediate family to go to college. Yeah. And what he discovered, he sort of looked around him not too long ago at his organization and realized that although the staff up to a certain level was fairly diverse, mm -hmm. that the senior management team was not. Yes. Uh, and he was really shocked by this because, uh, because of his own background yeah. uh, and the fact that he had come so far himself. Yeah. And he immediately began, you know, he admitted that this was an issue. Yes. Uh, he was disappointed in himself, and then he started to do something about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so it's a, uh, you know, it, it, emotional intelligence doesn't always mean that we do the right thing initially. Yes. What it does mean, I think, is that we, when we discover that something isn't right, we are willing to admit that yeah. and do something about it. Yes, yes. Uh, so um, I hope that's a good example. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, okay, I've got another question, which is to do with mindset, um, because I 